Hello everybody, this is Dr. Ali McGivel. Uh, today we'll cover coherent QPSK. We already have done binary phase shift keying and we'll look at coherent phase shift keying. Specifically, we need to look at how to generate and detect QPSK and we'll look at uh, the system as a whole, the coherent QPSK, and we'll look at the error probability of QPSK. So when I say Q, uh, Q P, uh, P S K, it stands for quadrature phase shift keying, and it is the information transmitted signal con is contained in the phase. F in Q P S K in quadrature, we have four components, four possible messages or symbols, and as you can see, we can draw them in a circle, which means the distance from the origin is the same, which means the amplitude is the same. So the information is not in the amplitude; it's rather in the phase. In uh, QBSK, the phase carries information, and we have one out of four possibly equally spaced values. Like, for example, I could choose pi over 4, 3 pi over 4, and so on. Other possibilities to start from 0, and then pi over 2, and so on. So the spacing between them is pi over 2. We can write the transmitted signal for this example as... SI of t, where i goes from 1 up to 4, as a cosine function. It's a vector, it's a cosine signal with the following amplitude. So, depending on the energy, I have square root of 2e over capital T, where capital T is the symbol duration, and e is the energy of the symbol. Now, we can have the phase as multiples of pi over 2. So, if i equal to 1, I will get 2 minus 1, which is... Uh, 1 times pi over 4. So in the following scenario, matches this phase representation. And the signal will be 0 outside that time. So it's a sine function, it's a cosine function with a given pi over 4 phase. Note that the frequency, as we mentioned before, is always integer multiples of the period, so we have full number of cycles within the symbol duration. Uh, each phase value corresponds to two bits because we have four symbols log base 2 of 4 is 2 so every symbol will be able to represent two bits now if you use gray encoding like we did before oh, then the difference between the bits we can rank them as uh, we make sure that the difference between every bit and the second is just one bit at a time all right so the signal is mentioned before we can also rewrite the signal in terms of its two components, cosine and sine. Note that in some books, there might be a difference in representing QPSK, like they start from 0 and then by over 2, or there could be sine differences where they have different phase uh, or base functions. But the idea would remain the same. So can we identify the orthonormal basis? The basis would be sine and cosine, or cosine and sine. And of course, there is no E here because the energy now is equal to 1. The basis for QBSK is cosine and sine. The basis for binary was just one base. It was a cosine function. So we can say that here is a distribution of bits. And here is the phase associated in radians per second. And sorry, in radians, the phase in radians. And then here is the coordinates. As I mentioned, that just need to note that there could be some different con uh, notations in different books for, for the signs. So this is to summarize the QPSK with the different regions, decision regions, assuming we have uh, minimum distance decoding. QPSK signals has two dimensional signal space. We have capital N equal to two and capital M equal to four. And it's a minimum average energy because it is centered around the origin. We cannot do any, any shifting or rotation, any shifting to make the energy less. So the energy, uh, the vectors will have will be made of cosine and sines and with the proper phase. Okay, in this uh, in this uh, slide we show the generation and the decoding of or the block diagram for QPSK transmitter and receiver. And as you can see here, we have binary sequence will be converted into scaled by the proper amplitude or energy or if you like phase, because we have minus or plus, and then. We will take every two bit at a time, every two at a time. We demultiplex them. So one will go to modulate the M phase component, and one will go down to modulate 
the out of phase or the quadrature component and then we combine them together to get our cube scale. So every one shot contains two bits. Now at the receiver side, since our bases are already made of cosine and sine, this would work as product modulator and at the same time demodulator. So we have the M phase component, the, quad the quadrature component, and then we compare a threshold of zero to make a decision. Because here we assume that we use minimum distance and everything is centered around zero. Once we get the decision from the top, decision from the down, we get two bits at a time. So please recall how to sketch the QPSK transmitter and how to sketch the QPSK receiver. An example, consider an input binary sequence of 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0 generate QPSK signal waveforms. So the first line at the top show the same sequence, 0, 1, 1, 0. We are going to dissect this into two bits at a time, so which we call die bit. And then based on this die bit, I will take the first, the odd number, which is zero, and generate the phase, which is minus cosine. I will take this one, okay, and then which is an even numbers of uh, even number sequence, and then generate a sine. The resultant signal will be zero times cos uh, or the proper minus times cosine and then plus times sine. We combine them together to get the transmitted signal. So the signal is a result of combination of two and it contains two bits. We will do the same for the remaining bits. So we have positive into cosine plus negative into sine. We combine them within the bit duration. One and zero, similar. So these are, they look the same. And then we have zero, zero, which means we have minus cosine and minus sine, minus cosine. And then also we have minus sine combined together and we got our signal. So input binary sequence shown in blue. Odd number bits of uh, uh, bits of uh, input sequence and associated binary sequence is shown here, and then even number of bits, uh, number of bits, even numbered bits uh, of the sequence and the associated binary phase shift keying is shown here, and then we combine them together. So we can say that the QPSK is made out of the sum of two binary phase shift keying. All right, now the received signal. Uh, the coherent, if you want to look at the error probability analysis, then you can say that the received signal will be made of a signal plus noise. And remember, we assume that in our analysis in this course that all the noise is zero mean additive gauss, additive white gauss and noise with power spectral density not over two, unless stated otherwise. So we combine them together and uh, the received signal will be compared with the basis. Once we multiply, you get your original signal plus noise. So what you get is either plus as a point, plus or minus E over, over 2. You know that we have E over 2 because E is the energy per, uh, uh, E is the energy of uh, point, but the X coordinate would be divided by square root of 2, and the Y coordinate would be the same. So X1 and X2 are samples of Gaussian distributed random variables with mean square root of E over 2. Although the signal is square root of E, but we get the X and Y coordinates. So we have this factor of 2. So basically, we, have, we can look at the two axes independently. Let's see this in the next slide. So QPSK system is equivalent to two coherent PBSK using two carriers, in phase and quadrature. The two binary phase shift keying systems have the following properties. The signal energy per bit now is square root of E over 2, because we are getting the projection. The noise density is n over 2. The average probability of bit error of each branch is related to the following. Now, we are, will have an error. Remember that we have just like a Gaussian, just like binary phase shift keying, but here, uh, we have the bit and we have e divided by 2, so we have e over square root of 2 because of the projection on the x and y axis. What is this? This is the probability of error, the probability of bit error for uh, one dimension. Now, when are we going to uh, get the bit errors in the phase and the quadrature? We are statistically independent. So we can say that the symbol will be correct if both the m phase and quadrature are correct. 
when do you get correct when we have one minus error why are we squaring because we are assuming that the symbols to be statistically independent which allows to use the direct multiplication for the joint probability so i'll take this to the next slide so please focus with me now i'm going to substitute the blue here part which is the probability of error for a single dimension and now let's square square of first minus two times second first times second i get error function plus square of second so one half becomes one fourth and error functions complementary square okay and this is the probability of being correct a symbol being correct so what's the probability of symbol being in error it will be one minus this so average probability of symbol error would be one minus being correct so this one is going to be cancelled and those signs are going to flip so one minus this guy is going to be error function minus the error function square now remember that as we increase e over over to a node the, the argument of the error function then the error will decrease and we have very small error so i'm saying if e over 2 in is very much larger than 1 then you expect the error to be small and if you square a small number you expect it to be even smaller so comparing the first expression a small number with a very small number of course under only under the assumption that that's given here i can say that the error function can be approximated uh, or the probability of error of symbol error can be approximated as error function and i can drop the second term compared with the first term Remember, this is just an approximation. All right. Now, if you uh, want to find the probability of error in another way, we can think of the geometric representation. And we had the union bound before that the probability of symbol error would be always less than or equal to one half, and we have to, su to sum over all probabilities. Four messages points are equally likely, assuming, and because of the symmetry, we can just find one and assume all the others to be the same. So this is coming from the union bond, but we have here the distance divided by two. The distance here, between although we have square root of e here, but the projection is square root of e over two, and the distance between the two symbols would be just two square root of two. So if you, if you get two times square root, you can take the two inside, it becomes four, and we get the following expression. So the distance from here is given by the following expression. I can substitute. So I can say that now, of course, I have distance from here. I have three possible distances. But no, these are the smallest two distances, and this is large. So under the assumption that E B over N, that the energy is much larger than one, I can drop this out of the summation, and I'll have only two expressions. And remember that these two expressions is square root of 2e which results in uh, 4 outside uh, which if you take the 2 and you take the 2 inside it becomes 4 so I get square root of e over 2 in naught. this is the error function this is approximate error using this one which is the same to what we had in the last slide well, the difference here is in this slide we're looking at the geometries and distances okay now this is again the summary the error fun the bit error rate for the for the q function is given by the following expression but let's see how we got this because so far we have deal we have dealt with the symbol error rate remember that the average transmitted energy per symbol in terms of signal energy per bit is two because every symbol contains two bits so it makes sense that the energy in one symbol equals twice the energy in a bit. The average point of, of symbol error in terms of, of uh, EB, I'll take the symbol error rate, I'll just replace EB with 2EB, so the two cancels, I got the expression. So what is this expression? It's still the symbol error rate, but in terms of energy per bit. Now we know that if we assume gray coding and we assume that uh, we have a good signal level, then almost every error in symbol will have only one bit so the bit error rate for qbsk will be half of that of symbol error rate remember here we are making some assumptions so the bit error rate equals to half the symbol error rate so i am i am copying this here and sharing here this is the bit error rate so if you want to compare 
the bit error rate for QBSK and BBSK, you will find them the same. Bit error rate for QBSK system is exactly the same as the bit error rate for uh, PBSK. However, QBSK system transmit twice as much data rate in every one transmission. And that is good because uh, sine and cosine are orthogonal. But remember, we have to make sure that we have coherent we mentioned we have coherent QBSK because without being coherent, then uh, you would lose your basis and you might not recover the signal, the phase correctly. So you can tell that QBSK is, is synchronization uh, demanding or it requires a proper carrier recovery. QBSK is more bandwidth efficient than PBSK. And this is a summary comparing QBSK with binary phase shift keying. They have the same probability of error. However, QPSK might be a bit more complex, but it has twice the bandwidth efficiency as compared to PBSK. Now, as an exercise, it would be fantastic, great, and if you can reproduce the following figure with MATLAB that shows you different levels of QPSK. So far, we have done binary phase shift keying and PPSK. If you can regenerate this with theory and, and simulation, on Monte Carlo simulation, that would be fantastic, and that would lead you to your project which is posted in the website. So please sketch this using MATLAB, use the proper log scales and DB scale, and make sure that you can get this by simulation and by theory. If you can do that, then you're good to go. Thank you for being good listeners and see you in coming videos with different modulation techniques.